So we are in the Chronological Life of Christ series, and where are we at as far as in where as far as where Jesus is at in his life, he's in the divine Galilean ministry, kind of the middle section. He's going to spend the most time here, three years. And specifically, where are we at? We are in the where he starts spe- uh, speaking in parables about the kingdom. And the first parable he's going to give is the parable of the sower. And so we want to look at a part two today on the parable of the sower. And as we looked at last week, we looked at Luke 8, 4 through 18. And for sake of time, I'm not going to uh, read that one again. You just heard Mark 4. But I want to read very briefly Matthew 13 because it is the longest explanation and the more in-depth version of the parable of the sower. And I think there's some critical details. Let's read this together again. That day Jesus went out of the house and was sitting by the sea. And large crowds gathered to him. So he got into a boat and sat down. And the whole crowd was standing on the beach. So you can see the setting, right? He's, uh, he's, he's gone out to a boat and he's using natural amplification off the water to pr- preach to this large crowd. What might be another reason why he got out into the boat? We know that the crowds had just pressed on him so much he couldn't even eat, whereas uh, we know his, his mom and brothers are going to come and try to rescue him. So kind of hard to, to crowd someone out in a boat. Why? Because if they're out a little bit, you know, you're <laughs> going to go into water before you can reach the guy. So it's kind of interesting, the setting. Verse 3, and he spoke many things to them in parables, saying, Behold, the sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seeds fell beside the road. And the birds came and ate them up. Others fell on the rocky places where they did not have much soil. And immediately they sprang up because they had no depth of soil. But when the sun had risen, they were scorched. And because they had no root, they withered away. Others fell among the thorns, and the thorns came up and choked them out. And others fell on good soil and yielded a crop, some hundredfold, sixty, thirty. He who has ears, let him hear. And the disciples came to him and said, Why do you speak to them in parables? Jesus answered them, To you it has been granted to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been granted. For whoever has to him more shall be given, and he will have an abundance. But whoever does not have, even what he has shall be taken away from him. Therefore I speak to them in parables, because they, they, while seeing, they do not see, and while hearing, they do not hear, nor do they understand. In their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is being fulfilled. Remember, this is quoting from Isaiah chapter 6 now. You will keep on hearing, but you will not understand. You will keep on seeing, but will not perceive. For the heart of this people has become dull. With their ears they scarcely hear. They have closed their eyes. Otherwise they would see with their eyes, hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and return. And that word epistrophe came, is, should be translated repent. And repent, and I would heal them. But blessed are your eyes, because they see, and your ears, because they hear. For truly I say to you that many prophets and righteous men desired to see what you see and did not see it, and hear what you hear and did not hear it. Hear then the parable of the sower. Now he's going to give the explanation. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. I'm going to pause there and say, remember, we gave so many sermons on if we preach the gospel, we preach the kingdom. Notice again, Jesus summarized there, the word or the message of what? The kingdom. When that message, that gospel message of the kingdom goes forth, Satan's trying to snatch it out of people. This is the one in whom the seed was sown besides the road. The one in whom was sown on rocky places, this is the man who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy, yet he has no firm root in himself but is only temporary. And when affliction or persecution rises because of the word, immediately falls away. A couple things I noticed there is how many Christians are trying to root or sanctify themselves in their own strength or power. And really, they're not even Christians. And because if you're trying to earn it on your own or trying to maintain it on your own, you're going to fail. You can't root yourself. There are many temporary Christians Christians who then who are not true Christians are pseudo believers and the proof of that is they fall away when affliction or any hard times arise third we see verse 22 and the one on whom the seed was sown among thorns this is the man who hears the word but the worries of this world and the deceitfulness of wealth or riches choke the word and it becomes unfruitful Mark added in a third one he calls it pleasure and so last week we talked about three thorns worry or fear Two would be riches and wealth, and third is pleasures, and, and, and guarding our lives from those thorns. 
And then we see lastly, and then one whom the seed was sown on good soil, this is the man who hears the word and understands it, who, indeeds, who indeed bears fruit and brings forth some hundredfold, sixty, some thirty. And I like how Luke says those who have a good and honest heart. And I know you said you guys, uh, if I move this just a little to the right here, I think you guys can see a little better. All right, let's try that. So when we look at this, we looked then at, at Mark 4, and one of the things we see in, in Mark 4 is that uh, he says that the, one of them had no moisture, and he talks about the sun scorching the seed, and, and so I want to look today, what, who is the sower? Who is the sun? What are some of these things? And so the title is Parable of the Sower, Part 2, and all these slides are new because last week, remember, we couldn't get the, everything working, but, but I asked last week, what kind of soil is your heart? Right now, right here, what is the soil of your heart right now? Is, is it good? Is it a good and honest heart that's receiving the word and receives it with joy and is seeking to obey it? Or if you're kind of honest, you have a hard heart this morning. Or maybe you have a divided heart where you, you surprise yourself. On, you can go and do great things for God and the same week do great things for the flesh and, and you're divided. As, and David said, Lord, give me an undivided heart. Or as Paul says, what I want to do, I don't do. And what I or what I want to do, I don't do. And what I don't want to do, I keep on doing. Maybe that's you this morning. And we say, Lord, change our hearts. I, I found this slide online, and it really captured the four hearts I wanted to speak on last week. The, he talks about this, this uh, trodden soil where people walk, and birds come and take the seed. And he says, that's a blind heart. A heart's disp disposition is blind from even grasping or understanding or receiving. They never believe. They ne it's a total rejection. He says the next is a rocky heart. They're enthusiastic at first, but then it's shallow and it lacks the strength to obviously continue and they fall away. Or, or the rebellious heart, a heart that partially commits to Christ, an insincere heart that, that, it, that leaves then to embrace the, the, the pleasures of this world of, of, of wealth or, or pleasure. Or a remaining good heart that is dedicated to Jesus, it stays firmly established and reaps forth the righteousness that God has created us to do. I slightly changed those at last week, and I said, I think this heart is a rebellious heart. They totally reject the gospel. It's the person who slams the door completely and says, I don't even want to hear it. You try to say, hey, can I, I wrote this gospel, try about the good news of Jesus. Don't want it. You know, and slams in your face. Next is the insincere heart, where they initially receive the gospel but then they fall away when any kind of hardship in the Christian life comes. Any persecution or any kind of stand they make for Christ, they, they want to go the, the easy, bride road that leads to destruction instead of the narrow road. Then third, the divided heart, where they're choked out, as I said, by those three things, worry, wealth, or pleasure. And then lastly, the good and honest heart, where they receive the gospel and they produce the fruit that God intended them to have. And so we talked a lot of last week as is what is the soil of your heart. But I spent the most time, the main point of the sermon, if you didn't get it last week, was actually why parables? Who remembers why did Jesus speak in parables? Is it a good thing or a bad thing? It's a bad thing. We said when Jesus spoke in parables, it was a form of judgment. And I had that pop quiz. Remember, I tried to remember it, but I actually have my notes here, so I want to re I read it for you here. Pop quiz, the Jesus teaching parables, A, all right, here's a little, little test here, capture imagery to convey a positive feel-good message where no one would be offended and is often exemplified by the secret sense of churches of our day. That's A. Okay, professor says no for A. B, the Jesus, was he a master storyteller and he used parables to make his message more interesting, fun, and enjoyable to listen to. Okay, we got a negative for B. C, Jesus was a promoter of the arts, all right? And he is on the cutting edge in delivering state-of-the-art creative talks that people will flock and listen to. Or D, this form of teaching was, was to blind his enemies from the truth, keep them from killing him at an inappropriate time, and was a form of condemnation and indictment to the unbelieving because they had already made up their hearts concerning Jesus. We know it's D, right? 
So parables are judgment for those who have already made up their minds and have evil, unbelieving hearts that reject Jesus as God, Lord, and Messiah. And it also then shows, it was also a way then to show the disciples in private how blessed they were to receive the gospel, to understand the gospel, and as the text says, be granted the mysteries or the secrets of the kingdom. But to the, re- but to the rest, parables. So do you want parables or not parables? (laughs) If you're getting parables, that means that's a bad thing. And that's why Luke, we we then went into depth, Luke 8.10. Seeing they don't see, hearing they don't understand. We then went through the entire explanation of Matthew 13, 10 through 17, how he then quotes Isaiah chapter 6. And we went through Isaiah 6, and we talked about how Isaiah says, Lord, here I am, send me. But God says, keep on listening, but you're not going to ever perceive. Keep on listening, but you're not going to understand. And he, and he says this, and this was what Jesus was saying in verse 10 of Isaiah 6. Render this people's hearts insensitive, their ears dull, and their eyes dim. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and repent and be healed. So when Jesus quotes this, what is he saying about the Pharisees' hearts? It's insensitive. And that the judgment he had rendered 700 years before his coming was applicable to them because they were rejecting their Messiah. So if you didn't get that last week, that was the ultimate point is understanding that in Matthew 13, there is a definite line where from that point on, he begins speaking in parables because from that point on, his nation and the religious leaders who represented the nation had what? Rejected him. And this is a sad state. I wonder, I wonder if God is is starting to speak in parables to America. I wonder if we are kind of at that line where it seems good, he's, he's given stories, but they just la, 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 they never actually get to the point. Do you see that in people's hearts? Religious but not saved. This was a line in the sand, and it was a terrible one, my friends, where people had made up their minds, and this was a form of indictment of judgment. I want to take a little bit of time to give you a context here, it's a, it's a little bit longer, but from Dr. Moore, who wrote the book, The Chronological Life of Christ, he has some really good insights. Please listen carefully. I know it's a little bit long, but be good listeners here. So the condemnation of the parable is not true that you're listening but never understanding. So be good listeners. Here we go. All right? This has been a busy day for Jesus, Dr. Moore writes. The healing of the blind, the dumb demoniac, the su- subsequent discussion, the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, the rejected request by the Pharisees that, they show, that he show them a sign from heaven. Jesus also then rejects his biological mother and brothers who sought to whisk him away and says, says, the true believers are those who do my will are not just concerned about what I've eaten. He now turns to the shores of Galilee and he goes to a boat to teach these huge and growing enormous crowds coming to seek the signs. And we know after this, he's going to even go out and escape from them. And, and this is where then he's caught on the lake in the storm and he calms the, uh, the Sea of Galilee before then going on to encounter the demoniac in the Gezerines. I'm sorry, in the Gerasenes. The seashore is a familiar place for Jesus. Both, both the house and the boat are likely Peter's in Capernaum. As we have seen before, Jesus used the boat as a pulpit and the shore as a natural amphitheater for teaching the crowds. What's different is Jesus' preaching is is in parables. He has used them before, but this time the whole sermon is a series of parables. This method will play a more dominant role in Jesus' teaching from here on out. His parables will polarize his audience, confusing some and delighting others. Before we begin an an investigation of the individual parables, parables here, Uh, in Luke 8, we will examine Jesus' use and interpretation of parables. Number one, Jesus employed stock metaphors of rabbinic parables. These were typical rabbinic illustrations. They were very familiar, and he gave a different nuance that they were missing because they were blind teachers. For example, they had used masters, fathers, and kings to represent God, or servants and children that represented God's people or his assistants, or a harvest standing for judgment where one is reaped and the other one is is thrown away like chaff, or the feast metaphors of a great messianic banquet representing the kingdom of God. Number two, Jesus' parables were were quite unlike other rabbis in that the concepts he taught were radically different. He used them both to reveal and to conceal. If I don't get to, I want to say to you today, if you don't understand and you reject, and if a person receives several opportunities to hear the gospel and their heart starts to get harder and harder, God sometimes says, this is the last time you're ever going to hear it. 
And God does harden hearts after the person's heart has already been hardened to a certain point. God says, you only have so many chances. That's a biblical concept, my friends. And if you hear, find your heart getting hard, that's not a good sign, just like in this case. Because he conceals sometimes after people have had so many chances. As with Israel, he says, you rejected me for so long, I've already decided your judgment. Stop praying for them, Jeremiah, because the judgment will happen now. There's no there's no, more, there's no more grace. I've had enough. God does have a line in your life where he's had enough, and, and there is no more second chances. He's a gracious God, abounding in loving kindness, slow to anger, but God does have a line, my friends. And can I tell you, urge you today, never test where that line is. That's why Hebrews says, today, if you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts as they did in the wilderness, because it conceals after a certain point. Number three, the Greek word parabole and the Hebrew word uh, mashal are used to signify a number of figures of speech which are not differentiated as precisely as we do in English. They represent, for instance, a parable, similitude, allegory, fable, proverb, riddle, or symbol. It's a broader category. So not all parables are ones of condemnation. Number four, Jesus' parables were not merely for illustration, but often delivered as the meat of the message. Five, Jesus' parables sprung uh, were sprung at the eyes from everyday life. In fact, one professor says that each parable in this sermon, Jesus has pointed out to objects that people well knew. A field, the woman baking, sprouting uh, seeds, mustard plants, and dragnets for the fishermen that were around those parts. Six, this is often one main meaning given to each of the major characters. There is often one main meaning given to each of the major characters or groups of the characters in the parable. Number seven, this series of parables is kingdom talk. It's always kingdom talk. The ideas are simply not just to entertain and, and tickle the ears. They're there to give concepts and understanding about the most important thing in life, which is the kingdom. But to those disciples who do not grasp the spiritual nature of the kingdom, these thoughts are, are inscrutable. They're, they're confusing. So Matthew and Mark inform us that this sermon is delivered off the shore of Galilee, likely near Capernaum. Jesus is in a boat a short distance from the shore. A large crowd stands on the bank. Where did all the people come from? Luke mentions that Jesus had been on a tour throughout the villages and cities of Galilee. As a result, people from each of the towns and villages he visited had probably followed him back to wherever he was going, in this case, Capernaum. They stand on the bank eager to hear more of what this man has to say. This first parable then about the sower apparently serves as an introduction to the entire sermon, just as the parable of the house of the owner in Matthew 13, 51 summarizes the whole sermon. It is different from the others in that it does not contain the phrase, the kingdom of heaven is like, like all the rest of them. We're going to get into these in the coming weeks. Thus, this parable sets the stage for hearing the other kingdom parables. Some, hearing these kingdom parables, will be a good soil. Others will be the rocky or thorny or the trodden soil. Some, even this crowd, will be, will, will be greatly blessed, and others, it will be a form of condemnation. And for a variety of reasons, they will not receive these parables. Some, because they're only confused because their hearts have already made up their mind and they have evil, unbelieving hearts. In Jesus' agricultural society, farmers would walk across their field with a sack of seed, grabbing handfuls and throwing them across the till ground. This was a very common picture in ancient Palestine. While it may not be readily apparent to our Western minds, the sower was not particularly concerned with the kind of soil in which the seed fell. You see, we plow before we plant, and we know what kind of soil we have, right? If it has lime in it or if it's clay and different things like that. In Jesus' day, they often plowed after planting. Thus, the road, hard soil, might become a fertile spot, and, and the rocky soil, which may not be visible now, would become apparent after the ground had been turned. Even if they plowed before planting, the farmer would afford to be, uh, could be afford to be generous in sowing seed because the more seed sown, the bigger the crop, or so was thought. He knows he's going to lose some seed on the edges of his field near the rocky crags, but it's worth a handful of seed to ensure that every bit of good soil is covered. I truly believe that uh, how our king and our God wants every bit of any heart. Isn't he going to try to cover and make sure he doesn't miss a single person? I truly believe that. So there are four types of soils, each representing the condition of the human heart. First, the hard path. It's, impenetra it's impenetrable. No seed can grow there. So the birds, which Mark says in Mark 4, 15, is Satan, snatch it away. Second, there's a shallow soil among the rocks. Matthew and Mark mention the, plant, uh, the plant's shallow roots. Luke mentions the lack of moisture. 
Anyone familiar with gardening realizes that there is no practical difference. It is the shallow soil which causes the lack of moisture. It goes hand in hand. Third, the weeds grow up with the seed and choke it out. Fourth, then there is good soil which produces an abundant crop. A good yield was tenfold. Jesus has a hundredfold yield. And, and, and so whether it's 30, 60, 90, or one reverses 90, 60, 30, or Luke says 100, the, the point is, are you fruitful and doing what the Lord has you here for? And so it, it grabs the attention of every gardener in the audience. Jesus is teaching then uh, from the boat, and the 12, a few close disciples are with him in the boat, probably as the secret service detail, probably, all right? Um, and when they see the bewildered looks uh, uh, among the crowds, they ask Jesus why he's trying to confuse them with parables and not speaking directly or plainly. This was not his normal style. They were able to ask him privately in the boat, even while Jesus is in front of the large crowd. Later, he will leave the crowd, teach his disciple privately the meaning of the parable. The secret of the kingdom, he said, is granted to you. And that needs to be figured out. Is something need to be revealed. Once the mystery is revealed, it is easily then to understand. Kind of like how Daniel revealed to King Nebuchadnezzar the parts of his dream that represented different things. So Dr. Moore writes this. The more we listen, the more we are able to understand. The less we listen, the less we are able to understand. It is like money in the bank. The more money a person is able to save, the greater his ability to earn further. People go to a restaurant that is full, not the one that is empty. We give responsibility to those who are responsible. Likewise, those who understand the nature and purpose of the kingdom will be instructed by these parables. But those who are not in the know, who reject the gospel, they will be further confused and disillusioned by parables. The parable then was the tool Jesus used to conceal the kingdom for many of his listeners or detractors or those trying to kill him. This quotation from Isaiah 6, 9 through 10 is most accurately translated by the Greek in Mark 4, 12. The Hebrew idiom might be rendered, seeing, they keep on seeing, but do not see. And hearing, they keep on hearing, but do not hear. Mark also adds the important sentence, otherwise they might turn or repent and be forgiven. This doesn't mean that no one in Jesus' audience will ever come to Christ It means that for right now, they're not able to accept the word of God through Jesus. Thus, Jesus' parables kept some from seeing the kingdom and repenting and being saved. Why would Jesus do that? That's a good question. From the context in Isaiah, it becomes obvious that this is a response. Parables are a response to unbelief. As an individual turns his back on Jesus, Jesus turns his back on the individual through parables. This would be similar in the New Testament. Those who deny him, he will deny them also. But even if we're faithless, he remains faithful. This is a fulfillment of the biblical principle that unbelief not only brings about judgment, it also destroys a person's ability to perceive the truth. He has a lot of verses here. John 3, 17, Exodus 8, 32, Romans 9, 17, Acts 28, 26, Matthew 7, 6, Luke 21, John 12, 39, Revelation 22, 11. Furthermore, this text from Isaiah 6 is used three times in the New Testament. Here, the responsibility for their ignorance lies with the preacher. That is, Jesus hid the kingdom through parables. In John 12, 40, the responsibility seems to be with God, who withdrew their opportunity for repentance. In Acts 28, the responsibility is laid at the feet of the audience. Underneath all this is the word here, used 13 times in, in, in Matthew 13. If the audience refuses to listen or to hear God's word, God's spokesman, then their opportunity is taken away. Furthermore, this text from Isaiah 6 is used three times in the New Testament. Oh, I already said that, sorry. Does God ever reject anyone? Yes, but not whimsically. God's rejection is based on a number of things. Number one, a response to man's sin. Number two, mutual rejection between God and man. Three, purging the remnant. For opening the door for the Gentiles, and then lastly, the closed heart and ears of unrepentant people. Matthew adds these important words in verses 16 through 17 with the underscore of our privilege to see the kingdom or understand the gospel. He, Dr. Moore writes, we might think they were pretty lucky to live in those phenomenal times and to be and see Jesus, but we by far more privileged than they because we enjoy being a part of the kingdom of God and having the canon of scriptures that give the clearest and most complete picture. We are the recipients that even the prophets longed for. And says, as Peter says, they long to look in these things, but, but they've been revealed to us. How blessed are we, guys? We have all the scriptures. 
And so he ends the, then by saying, we are fortunate that Jesus gave us his own interpretation of the, of the parable. Number one, the path. People who have no desire for the word of God, it, it, the, it, the gospel can't penetrate. Satan snatches it away so that they may not believe and be saved. Number two, the rocks. People who then fall away through trouble or tri tribulation. Matthew and Mark use the word immediately to describe how they individually receive the word, but how they immediately fall away. This individual is quickly willing to receive the word, but when the going gets tough, they stop, drop, and not roll, but they, they leave. Third, the weeds. They get choked out. And we remind our readers that the good seeds are in, com are in competition with the weed seeds. As they grew up together, the weeds went out. Jesus describes three things that are dangerous to the Christian. Life's worries, life's riches, and life's pleasures. For the good soil. These are people who receive the word through hearing and obedience, and they produce a bumper crop. And so I want to just ask you, do you have a heart to produce a bumper crop? We can talk then about some of the context of where this was happening. Let me then just summarize what I covered last week. Who is the sower? I think the Lord ultimately is the sower, but we are his ambassadors as if Paul says he's making his appeal through us. Can I say how many seeds of the gospel have you thrown lately? Are you sowing? I mean, the Lord is the ultimate sower, but we also are commissioned as, as those who plant his fields. Who are the birds? It's interesting, birds are plural. Satan, we know, is the bird, but Satan has minions called demons, but he also has agents called enemies of the cross, who Paul says there's God is their, is the, is their stomach and whose end is destruction. And there are many enemies of the cross, are there not, who are trying to take away and keep people from believing the gospel. What is the sun or the moisture? The moisture we talked about in Sunday school could be the Holy Spirit, could be the Word of God, but they never grow and, and it never produces its crop. And the sun, and I think it's just the, this fallen world of life comes and scorches them out and, and the thorns then are, as we said, life's pleasures and, and life's uh, riches and life's worries. And what is the crop? I ultimately believe it's the souls of people because the whole point is getting people into what? The kingdom. These are kingdom parables. This could be acts of righteousness, but most likely, this, these are souls, my friends. And I would say to you, are you going to be a Brad who disciples 60-some people? Are you going to be an Alden Laird who I think has led over 100 people to Christ? Are you going to be a Billy Graham who has a yield? Or are you going to be someone who said, I believe it myself, but I didn't, I didn't love anybody enough to bring anybody with me? So last week, and this is uh, the slide you didn't have, but we said this, this, this parable teaches us on, on sovereignty and salvation. God grants salvation. Some have and some don't. I don't know why not everybody hears. I personally think it's because God knows their hearts. Does that mean he puts all the evil hearts in Muslim countries? I don't know. You look at the news, it seems pretty evil to me. But if you have and you hear and you understand, this passage says how blessed you are that you have received, each of you, even by hearing the sermon, the mysteries, the secrets to get in the kingdom, that it's a gift you receive, you don't earn. It's by repentance that you might turn and repent and Christ would heal you, not because you make yourself righteous or you earn it or you deserve it. You don't. It's absolutely by sheer grace, amen? And for that, my friends, go out this door and thank God that out of the 7 billion of the people in the, in the world, you have the grace, you have the secrets of the kingdom, amen? amen? And you praise God for this sovereignty. As Romans 10 says to us then, how will they hear unless they, you go and preach to them? How beautiful are your feet if you bring them good news? Are you bringing anybody good news or are you a bunch of stinky feet? Be beautiful feet. We talked then about um, some hisses of, of hyper-Calvinism. But we also didn't get to the three hisses of Arminianism. You can't lose your salvation. You can't come to God on your own. If he doesn't illuminate you with the gospel, if he doesn't soften your heart, if he doesn't convict you of sin, rise, and judgment, you will never come on your own. And you will never be entirely sanctified <laughs> until you get to heaven. So be balanced in that. Point two is human responsibility. This passage preaches strong human responsibility. What? What's, what's your heart? Is it a good and honest heart? Is it a hard heart? Is it a divided heart? Is it an insincere heart? What kind of heart do you have? Are you hearing and seeing all these messages? But every week you're like, I didn't get anything out of it. Are you hearing? Are you receiving the word with joy and saying, these are not just words. These are God's words that feed my soul. 
we are responsible for our heart. And if you harden your heart, there are consequences in how God responds. I want to remind you, when there's a whole debate in Calvinism and Arminians, who hardened Pharaoh's heart? Did you know that God did harden Pharaoh's heart? But if you look closely at the text, can I tell you, Pharaoh hardened his heart three times before the Lord hardened it. And so I would say to you, be careful of whatever many times God has that you do not harden your heart. Or as Hebrews says, do not harden your heart as some of the wilderness did who turn away from the living God. Because at some point, then God can harden your heart because he's then to cite out his perfect justice to, to give you what your heart really deserved. Do we understand it all? No. But then I ended here and I end this message with point three. Understanding the different hearts. This I said last week helps us understand what's happening in our church. There are going to be four kinds of people that come in, and we should not be discouraged when this, when, when this happens. That is, there's going to be some who come into our midst or those we witness to if we go to our neighbor. <laughs> the gift always keeps giving, coming back. But then I, I call the next one the sprouters. They spring up immediately say, oh, yeah, we're all with you. We're, we're one of you. I, I'm wearing the big seed T-shirt. And then the first hardship of, in their life, they fall away from the Lord, and they never come back. They're a pseudo-believer. They, I believe, didn't fully, completely ask Christ to be Lord. They said, I want all the benefits of Jesus, how he makes me healthy, wealthy, and wise, the prosperity gospel. Oh, but I need this hardship. No, I don't want it. That was, that's not what I signed for. They sign up for an incomplete, unbiblical contract, and they're not truly believers. Because Jesus is Lord is how much of the course and under how many of the conditions? All of it. Not just the good parts, the Joel Olstein parts. And then there's the leavers. These are the ones that break your heart. You say, wow, they were with us for so long. And, but remember what John says? He says, some, by leaving us, prove that they were never with us from the beginning. And it breaks your heart because they get choked out. And then they leave. And, and some shipwreck their faith and show they were never believers to begin with. And I, I agree with Dennis. I'm not sure if the thorns, I said, there's a possibility in my mind that the third soil may be a believer who just never produces much fruit. But that was only looking at Luke. When I looked at the rest of them, one of the gospels says they produce no fruit. And I agree, if there's no fruit, you are not a believer. That's not a possibility. Because the Holy Spirit, as the mark and proof of a true believer, he promises to produce fruit in how many believers? Everyone. And if you have no fruit, read the rest of Scripture. You're cut down and thrown where? He says, give it a year for it to burst fruit. But if it doesn't, cut it down and throw it, throw it away into the fire. That is not a believer, my friends. So MacArthur could be right after all. All right. Uh, number four, and that is I want to urge you, be a yielder. Be someone who yields. We talked about in Sunday school a man named Elmer Agel. Now, a funny name, farmer Nebraska, led my grandfather Christ, the first Christian, as far as we know, in our side of the family. So Elmer befriended Ray Laird, led him to Christ, these two farmers. My, my grandfather was a school teacher in a little one schoolroom house in, in a farming community in, near Hay Center, Nebraska. Elmer led him to Christ, and Elmer's far, far with the Lord now. His, he died many years ago. But can I tell you, Ray was faithful to lead his four children to Christ. And as far as the grandchildren, as far as we know, all 60 of us are living for the Lord. And as I said in Sunday school, I think Elmer's going to stand before the Lord. And he's like, well, I led Ray and a couple of... No, no, you got more here, buddy. Ray then led these guys, and then these guys led these guys, and all of them led these guys, and Chad led these guys. And Elmer's going, that's awesome. And I would say to you, who led Billy Graham to the Lord? Think of all that reward. And then all those people and all those people, doesn't that guy have whoever, you know, multiply? And I would say, be a yielder. Yield 30, 60, 90. And the multiplier effect, you're like, bring people with you into the blessed kingdom. Lastly, what's the, the, what is the condition of your heart? Are you a packed soil, trodden soil? Total rejecter, never give it a chance. Satan just comes, the seed never even germinates. Are you stony ground? You have a hard heart? Where persecution comes, you just want things easy. You just want everything to go your way. You just want to be happy. Maybe you're being choked right now by three things. Worry, riches, or pleasure. Or do you have, as Luke says, a good and honest heart? This kind of breaks it all down in its meaning, but if I can just urge you, be a yielder. 
Bring people with you. Work hard at keeping your heart soft before God. And when your heart starts to get soft, admit that to God and say, God, break my heart over things that what breaks yours. God, help me to hate my sin. And be honest with him. Say, I love that sin. It's attracted me. Help me to hate that. And Lord, I have a divided heart like David. And, and Lord, I want to cry out to you. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God. Renew a right spirit within me. If that describes you, I hope that you'll just pray with me as we just ask the Lord to give us a good heart this morning. Father, I, I thank you for this parable. There's four different soils in this room, four different kinds of hearts. There's the rebellious, rejecting heart. There's the insincere heart that signs up for an incomplete contract with you, expecting you just to give them and serve them instead of them serving you under any and all conditions, and so they'll fall away because they're not true believers. They'll say to you, Lord, Lord, did we not do all these things? And you'll say to them, I never knew you, you who practice lawlessness. There's those here who are being choked, Lord. They're, the thorns are alive and well in their life, and they're doing nothing to pull the weeds out of their Christian life, Lord, and, and the weeds are just growing up and consuming them, and Lord, they're being overtaken by riches and worries and pleasures, and I just pray, oh God, that if there's any true believers here who see the thorns, that we would be diligent this week to weed our, our spiritual garden, to put off and to put on whatever is displeasing to you, so we can be totally in the clear and say, all of me is all for you, oh Jesus. Because, Lord, I pray that every single person here would be a yielder. They would produce that 30, 60, 90, 90, 100 fold. That we would be faithful, like at Elmer Eagle, just to lead whoever you bring into our lives to Christ, but especially our own children. And to be unashamed of the gospel, to, to make sure we've witnessed as far as we know to all of our relatives, all of our friends, all of our neighbors, so that we can say, as far as it depends upon us, we've let them all know how to get in the, the kingdom. Because you've graciously given us the, the key, the confession of Christ, that Jesus is Lord, repentance and faith to get in that kingdom. Lord, may we spread that message far and wide. And Father, I just pray, Lord, that we would be, Lord, a church that just sees truly that crop, that, that multiplicative effect going on. Please, Lord, bring it about for our church, for your glory, not to us, not to us, nothing to ourselves in our own glory, but to you alone be all the glory in Jesus' name and God's people said, amen.